Good evening, everyone. If we could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mr. Dixon? Here. Mrs. Diglio? Here. Mrs. LaFoy? Here. Mrs. Teets? Here. Mayor Coos? Here. In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, notice of this regular meeting was given to the two newspapers of record and posted on the official bulletin board on January 5th, 2024. At this point, I will entertain a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes from June 10th, 2024. I will make a motion to approve the minutes from June 10th, 2024. I will second. Yes. Any discussion? Changes needed? Okay. A roll call, please. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Diglio? Yes. Mrs. LaFoy? Yes. Mrs. Teets? Yes. Mayor Coos? Yes. At this point in the meeting, the town council welcomes comments from any member of the public on any topic to help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit the opportunity for everyone who wishes to be heard. Speakers are asked to take one turn at the microphone and please limit their comments to three minutes. The clerk will keep time. If reading from a prepared statement, please provide a copy and email a copy to the clerk's office after making your comments so it may be properly reflected in the minutes. Council may choose to comment after the entire public portion has concluded. Please identify yourself and spell your last name for the record. As is customary, we'll begin with anyone in person who would like to speak. If so, please stand up to the microphone. Not seeing anyone, we'll transition to Zoom. If anyone on Zoom would like to speak, please indicate so by raising your hand. I've got somebody. Whoop, oh, where'd she go? Hold on. Dr. Mikaj. Okay, Dr. Mikaj, you're up. Yes, do you hear me? Just okay. uh, the audio is a little low. See if you can speak a little louder or closer mm -hmm. to the microphone. Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay, good. Good evening. Um, I'd like to uh, to raise my voice about the estimated tax bill that just arrived last uh, last week. Maybe it's a mistake, but uh, I'd like to notice for you guys what I notice on this tax estimated tax bill. I mean, maybe I'm a little quick on my uh, reasoning here, but I have still a lot of homework to do. Number one, uh, I see that uh, on the estimated tax bill, the way that uh, we are promised by the AS, uh, the company that you hired, how to, uh, to do the assessment uh, on all the town, it is not the number that they promised, number one. So here it is 2.724 and it was not this number. Number two that I noticed, very interesting enough, uh, I'm just taking the, an example, my own properties and my families, um, which um, on my, again, on my homework, I do not find that anywhere, but again, you may prove me wrong, uh, that um, I see within one year, more than doubling the tax. Um, so based on this uh, estimated tax bill, which means not only doubling, but going to the, tripling that, which um, again, sounds a little, un I mean, not a little, quite of unreasonable on my end. <clears throat> Number three, it is, um, again, after I did a very quick homework, for example, to make it easy for the audience and for the panel people out there, uh, let's take a house that one of you on that room, let's say, um, the assessment of the house, it is doubling of my assessment of my home. Yet, the taxes for that house, which is doubling the assessment of my one of my properties, is lower the tax rate than my property. 
So now my question to you, it is again, uh, just I'm giving you an example so you can have a little the picture. One minute warning. One more, okay, I'm almost done. So my question it is, does this sound right to you when you take fast of fast two, two properties? One is double the assessment and is paying less taxes than the other one, which is half of the assessment. So that is the question. And if you find it is unfair, in your eyes, then is there room for you to do some uh, some uh, work and to get back to me either today or this week? Already, I started to move. Uh, I came today to see the um, tax, tax assessor. He was not there. I made an appointment. I'm going to see him next week. But instead of leaving me anxious here, because nobody likes to see such a bill when we were promised by the town that uh, you do something good to help the residents. And I'm part of this community, which I'm looking for a fairness on those. Time is up. Assess. Okay, that's it. So my question is, is that fair? Thank you, Dr. Makaj. If anyone else on Zoom would like to speak, please indicate so by raising your hand. I don't Just see any there. other hands, Mayor. Be careful. Hmm? I don't see any other hands on Zoom. Thank you very much. Now move to council and manager reports, beginning with town manager Russo. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, before I do the recognition, just for Ludmilla, I believe Scott's off this week. So her course of action is the correct one to speak to Scott next week about the assessment, just to verify that whatever data she's looking at accurately reflects what was done during the reval. And then if she has any questions about the rates, she can speak to Teresa Um you know, just to make sure that there's no error in how things were printed out for her. Um, only other item, Mayor, is uh, we have a recognition tonight. I want to recognize the career and dedication of Monica Maybach, our Chief Municipal Finance Officer, who's retiring at the end of the month. And um, I believe the Mayor and Deputy Mayor have a presentation for Monica this evening. We have the retirement gathering on Thursday, but on behalf of all the employees, professionals, and volunteers, a sincere thank you for all your hard work uh, the past several years, Monica, that you've spent with us here in the town, especially considering the COVID pandemic and all the challenges that came about through the pandemic, numerous grants, and a tremendous amount of work um, that you've undertaken uh, for water and sewer projects that have really added a lot to your plate. So my thanks and sincere appreciation all your hard work and the years of service to the town. It's it's very much appreciated and I wish you and your family well in your retirement. And with that, I'll ask the mayor and deputy mayor to handle the presentation. Thank you. So Monica has been in a number of different places during her career, but found her final home here with Lincoln. And you know, I've only known her and worked with her for a couple of years, but in those few years, she has uh, called some of my comments uh, uh, far fetched, and I appreciate that because you know, try to leave notes, don't go turn here. She provides the proper guidance when it's needed. So thank you very much, Monica, and congratulations on your. <laughs> Monica, I just want to echo the comments um, of our town manager. Um, we had the COVID pandemic. We've had more grants than we've ever had. We have more shared service agreements than we've ever had. We have all of the water and sewer projects that we're undertaking. Um, there are multi-year initiatives. But um, you know, your retirement is a culmination of a long career that um, where you have touched people in, in ways that you probably have no idea how, right? You think about how we're working in customer service centered and the employees at Town Hall work day in and day out to make sure that this municipality runs the best way possible, the most fiscally sound possible, and um, that doesn't go unnoticed, although not always in the front. We appreciate the time that you put in the meetings. Um, and you know, retirement is what's supposed to happen after a job well done. So a job well done. I hope you have many, many years of good health and, and happy memories ahead of you. Thank you. You want to say a few words? It's 
it's been a pleasure meeting for employees and professionals. But one person who isn't here, I'd really like to thank is my husband because many years, many winter months, January through March, and many Saturdays and Sundays, I'm at that dining room table doing budget. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to send my thanks for his support uh, over all these years. But thank you. It's been a, been a pleasure. I met some wonderful and great people over the years. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we like sprites. <laughs> Council Member Dixon. Yeah, um, so just a couple things. First of all, there was no um, historic preservation committee, so I have nothing to report there. Um, I did want to congratulate the all the graduates from the class of 2024, and I want to congratulate uh, Monica on her retirement and thank her for her dedicated service to the town of Newton. Thank you, Councilmember Dixon. Councilmember Diglio. Yes, Monica, I want to say thank you for your excellent CFO. You have been wonderful, and thank you, especially for always helping me with the LOSAP program. For the, for the Newton Pro State Squad. Thank you. Council Member Teets. Um, just a couple of quick things. School board meeting is tomorrow night, so I don't have an update for tonight. Um, and what else? Oh, uh, everybody that's been going to the poll, that's great. It looks like the poll is where it's at this summer so far. Um, I don't know how it was today because there was an extreme weather difference. <laughs> But uh, it's really good. And I hope everyone that is going to the pool is enjoying it. Um, and also congratulations to Monica. Always nice to sit here and see your friendly face in front of me. And just for the record, purple is my favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I had heard from Steve Moran that he is retiring as a special officer in July. Um, so I spoke with him at the graduation last week. And uh, so I don't know what day in July, so that I don't miss the opportunity to thank him for his years of service. Um, and I know from talking to people on the street, um, dispatching and all that kind of good stuff, Steve was a great representation for the town of New Inn. Um, so he will be surely missed off the street. But he did tell me that he will come back and have lunch or dinner with me. So uh, I look forward to that. And also congratulations as well to the graduates. Um, <laughs> wish you all well, whether you're going on to middle school, high school, college, or starting a career. Be safe, make good decisions. And I believe that is all I have for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Lafoy. Yes, thank you. Um, not sure if anybody saw this referenced um, in the paper, but tomorrow, June 25th, from 2 to 4 p.m., the Newton Police Department will be hosting ice cream with a cop at the Newton Pool. So it's an opportunity to go out and meet your officers and uh, talk all things law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to thank the Newton Police Department for their continued um, community-minded initiatives and community policing initiatives. Um, I know that we appreciate it and um, it's always great feedback from the town. So I know Chief Van Newland's on uh, line with us tonight. So thanks, Chief, for uh, the department hosting that once again. Um, also coming up on uh, July 13th from 7 to 9 um, is our first Concert of the Stars event for the summer. Um, and that's in partnership with the town of Newton, Thor Labs, Sussex County Community College, um, the rock band, Mighty Spectrum Band will be performing in the event that there's rain, the rain date will be Monday the 15th. Um, and um, we're doing that in sponsorship and in partnership uh, with Thor Labs, the college, and over Hampton and Green Townships as well. Um, I just wanted to thank and acknowledge all of the town hall employees that have been dealing with the HVAC issues the last week or so. Um, thank you for your 
um, response and patience. Um, I know that there's been no air conditioning and it probably happened the worst week of the year <laughs> so far this year. Um, so thank you all for being flexible and pivoting and working in other places. And then for so many of you that, that came in um, and worked here during the heat, um, hopefully the continued work will, will hang on for a little while longer. Our planning board meeting for the month is uh, Wednesday. So we have nothing to report at this point. Also want to extend my congratulations for a great opening of the pool. Um, we've been getting some numbers and uh, people from not only the town, but all over the county um, have been coming out and enjoying the pool, which is fantastic. Uh, all great comments so far. Um, and uh, Michelle, thank you for, uh, I didn't realize that Officer Moran was, was retiring again. So thank you for informing us of that. And uh, you know, we wish him well and congratulations and thank him for his service. Um, he's probably, uh, one of the most well-known officers from the businesses on Spring Street, because I have personally seen him go into each of the businesses, greet the owners, say hi to the customers, buy a coffee, or, you know, just be present. So um, again, an extension of our wonderful community policing, just our department being ever present, not just in the needs uh, in response to emergencies. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, I think that's all I have right now, Aaron. Thank you very much. Uh the only thing that I will add is just in response to Dr. Makaja's comments. Um, so as the manager uh, Russo mentioned, um, it sounds like you have a reasonable plan set up to speak with both the assessor and then the tax collector, Ms. Schlosser. Um, I, I think it's also fair to mention that, you know, while you may have seen an increase in your tax bill, the town's share of that tax bill only is 35%, 15% is the county 50% is the school district. And if you were, uh, uh, if you checked in on the, our budget hearing, uh, originally our proposal was to increase the average household uh, tax bill by $60 uh, for the year, $5 a month, uh, through the work of our financial professionals who may or may not be leaving us, um, <laughs> as well as the rest of the staff. Uh, we were actually to, able to almost uh, cut that in half down to about $36. Uh, on the average household. So um, un understanding that, that you know, you saw an increase, um, it, it could have been worse, at least from the town side. And, and, you know, our professionals worked hard to cut what we were originally proposing in half. Um, so, you know, I would potentially also, um, in addition to speaking with the assessor, the collector, you also have the opportunity to appeal your assessment. Um, but, you know, you can also share your comments with both the county commissioners and uh, the school district. Um, it's not just a, a one-sided coin here. Um, you know, there are multiple different stakeholders involved with creating your tax bill. And, um, you know, we all have to work hard to, uh, to you know, keep it as user-friendly, if you will, for the people who live in our town. But um, it, it is a multi-stakeholder uh, effort. Great points. Moving on, uh, we have a second reading of public hearing. Uh, ordinance 2024-17, uh, bond ordinance reappropriating $51,581, proceeds of obligations not needed for the original purpose for the establishment of an auto shop by the town of Newton, New Jersey. Uh, open the hearing to the public. If anyone in person would like to speak in the matter. If anyone on Zoom would like to speak, please indicate so by raising your hand. I don't see anyone on Zoom. Close the hearing to the public. Uh, call for a discussion at this time, and we have a couple of professionals in the audience. We raised a number of questions for those professionals, if they wouldn't mind perhaps coming up for a discussion. Mayor, I'll throw in a few comments, comments if I could. Um, go, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, no. So I know Councilman Dixon, Matt, had some good questions about the process and some of the things, you know, questions about what went into the decision to kind of move forth with the auto shop. So um, Matt had sent over some questions, which Kenny and Adam were helpful in responding to. So the council should have those responses via email. Um, but I think Kenny and Adam can kind of walk through the, the thinking and the thought process that went into going down this uh, particular road, um, you know, as a recommendation for the municipality and then also Chief Ennell and um, was instrumental in having those conversations initially with Kenny and Adam 
So maybe if um, Kenny and Adam can start off and the chief could jump in and then see if Matt or anybody has additional questions and um, see if the council agrees with the recommendation of the staff. Thank you. Okay, to start off, um, the chief called me into his office one day to have a meeting with me to just go over some things on the mechanical side because he was spending more than he would like with the new owners of Boone Tire and whatever else they have going on. And after talking to him about it, going over what we, you know, simply just thought might save us money and be less of a headache in the long run, we figured if we had someone on staff in DPW with some lifts, we could do regular routine maintenance and, and more of that kind of stuff and just save money and downtime on vehicles and make it easier for all the departments. That's kind of the basis of where that whole thing started. Um, I don't know if Steve wants to. Yeah, I, I can. So, you know, um, obviously everybody knows Boot and Tire was, uh, you know, Jay retired and it was purchased by, you know, another uh, another person. And, um, you know, he they have a different business model than what Jay had. So they, you know, Jay had a more volume type of model and the new owner has a more value type of business model, which, you know, um, directly impacted my uh, maintenance budget. So, you know, things that I was paying for in the past with Jay, you know, uh, kind of fit my managed budget that I was allowed. And recently with the new owner, you know, again, he has a different mindset, different business model. Uh, I noticed a significant increase in, in, um, in billing. So, we also had some instances where, you know, we had some, uh, one car, uh, you know, the, the battery was hooked up backwards and did $6,000 worth of damage to the car, um, you know, and the owner was great, you know, he paid for the damage, um, but, you know, we do have an issue. Uh, these are, you know, uh, different from your just your regular, you know, um, consumer automobile. Um, you know, Jay and his employees were very well versed in, in servicing the, you know, police cars. And, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, the staff at uh, Boot and Tire might have a little bit of a difficulty with, uh, you know, these types of cars. Um, I, one thing, you know, I, we needed new police tires for our cars. So, you know, Jay always gave us a great price on tires and, you know, it was very economical. We didn't have to go down through our state contract pricing, uh, you know, but, you know, again, when we reached out for the new owner, you know, the price was a significant increase. So I had to go and, you know, go down to, uh, you know, go through state contract to purchase tires. The pricing difference was about $120, $140 a tire. So, you know, you do the math for tires, you're talking, you know, $450. And then, you know, we, we did, you know, four cars, you add it up, you know, it's a significant amount of money that, you know, was coming out of the budget. Um, while I was kind of researching about doing state contract with the tires, I was talking to other police chiefs at, you know, my, uh, my monthly meeting and everybody was in kind of shock. Like you don't have your DPW, you don't have an in-house mechanic. I'm like, no. Um, and it seems like that's really the norm across the board throughout the county. Uh, everybody, you know, every other municipality has their own, um, uh, you know, mechanic on staff or mechanics on staff. You know, as you know, we have a very large fleet. You know, we have our police fleet, our DPW fleet, and our water and sewer fleet. Um, so we're, we're kind of like an anomaly to, you know, most towns because they don't have a water and sewer like, like we do. So, I mean, that adds a whole nother dimension to our fleet service. Um, so, you know, and you talk to other, um, you know, other departments and they're like, it's such a cost savings. I'm spending a hundred dollars per hour, um, to go to either a dealership or to boot and tire, um, to, you know, get a repair done on the car. So if we do it in house, I mean, we have our initial startup fee, you know, lifts and tire machines and such, you know, so I think it's like 50,000, 52,000 roughly. Um, but once we have that initial investment, we'll start making our money back because, you know, we are going to save immensely on our labor costs. 
And then where we're really getting kind of beat up is our, um, again, referring back to Jay, is our premium that we pay for our parts. So we could actually be, you know, like a wholesale vendor, you know, so they would sell it, you know, the car uh, supplier, auto suppliers would sell our the parts to us as a wholesale. So that's where we are really getting beat up right now is the price of the parts. Uh, I know I've just done uh, a couple of repairs you know, all around brake job for one of the cars was almost, you know, $900. I've had to go to dealership a couple of times for a couple of things, uh, you know, kind of just started relying on the dealerships, you know, I'm, you know, $1,400, $1,600 uh, bills where, you know, if we did it in-house, it might only be $600. So, you know, we're saving a, a ton of money uh, on our labor costs and part costs. The other thing is that we hot seat our cars, the police department. So that pretty much means like, you know, somebody's getting out of the car and somebody's getting back in the car. So our cars are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and I don't have the luxury to sit and wait for somebody to make a repair on the car. Again, Jay was awesome. I'm sorry to see that he retired selfishly. But if we brought a car down there at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning and said, hey, Jay, we need this car by noon, that we got the car by noon. Whereas now we don't get the car back. The car with the battery issue, it, it, that car was out of service for three weeks. So, you know, it makes it tough when you're trying to manage a fleet and manage officers going to calls and I don't have cars to put them in. You know, I can afford to go down one car, two cars, we have a problem. So, and, and that's my real issue. I feel like if we move in-house, Obviously, you know, we could get those cars back on the road. We'd be saving money on parts and labor. So uh, that's why I, you know, uh, started a conversation with Adam and Kenny to say, hey, here's an opportunity for us because, you know, the dynamic changed, unfortunately, with Jay selling his business. And, you know, we've been very fortunate as a town to have Jay and, and uh, you know, his support and, uh, you know, providing mechanical service to the town. But unfortunately, you know, the times have changed and we need to make a decision on, you know, what we're going to do. And uh, I really feel like going in-house is cost savings to the town, beneficial to getting our, our equipment up and running properly, proper maintenance. So that's, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I have probably two questions. Um, Chief, does it do anything to, if we have, do we get vehicle warranties and stuff like that with the police vehicles or any vehicles in our fleet? So on the police side, we get, you know, our basic 36,000 three years, um, you know, and there's some uh, emissions uh, like catalytic converters and different items on our emission side that are have an extended warranty, usually out to 80,000 miles and such. Anything in that realm, we would, you know, it would be diagnosed in-house. And if it's a warranty item, then we would bring it to the dealership to get obviously warrantied. We wouldn't do in-house warranty work. We would just send it out to the, you know, to whatever manufacturer, uh, you know, of the vehicle that would need to be warrantied. Thanks. And then my second question is just um, training. Like if we have a mechanic, um, do they have to go to yearly training? Or well, we would definitely send him to more training. I mean, he's certified in a few things that he needs to be certified in order to get the ball rolling on this. Some of the some of the diesel things he doesn't have, but as far as everything else, he's he's good with. And I just want to say that the we jumped on the opportunity to hire him when we had the chance because. Our recycling attendant who was full-time left and whether this worked out or not he was still someone who's been applying and trying to get in here and we figured we'd hire him and if he's, he's dpw labor and he can still help us to do mechanical if this did not work out so we looked at it as, as that reason behind. and i know you guys are very handy and stuff so if he was to be on vacation or sick yeah. leave from or all the other towns we talked to if that only have one mechanic, they try just not to schedule anything when he's going to be on vacation or he's going to be out. And if emergency pops up, they take care of it in-house if they're capable. If not, then they figure it out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Matt, I know a lot of these questions were yours. I don't know if you want to 
follow up on anything specifically. I just wanted to give you the opportunity, Mr. Virtual. Yeah, um, I just kind of, I a lot of a lot of things, I guess, are kind of answered. Um, one of the things that's still just kind of sticking with me, though, is um, just, just uh, I guess, it's two part. First part is, um, did we, why didn't we reach out and explore any of these garages that the municipalities or the county may have about if there could be any sort of uh, agreement with them of doing a shared service, especially the county. Um, I mean, not everybody might remember, but in 2018 when I ran, I kind of, you know, said about the tax exempt properties and if, you know, there was with them that would potentially, um, you know, they would be willing to work with us uh, since we have so many tax exempt properties where it would cost us very little. Um, so, you know, I'm just not sure if we considered shared service with other, and then, you know, while I'm talking about shared services, also one of my big concerns would be, um, once we get this up and running, if we did, um, the potential of we brought in additional, uh, municipalities as a shared service, the increased strain and potential need to hire more mechanics um, or anything like that. Um, Matt, I don't know whether you can hear me or not, but as far as with the shared service, we have looked into this. Um, I've looked into this a few years ago too. Um, the issue with shared service we've found is a lot of municipalities, a lot of townships, their vehicles, whatever the shared service is, that comes first. So immediately, if they have an emergency or something like that, it doesn't make a difference how important our stuff is, that gets put on the back burner. And then we end up sitting there waiting anyway. And the municipality flat out tells you that. We come before you do. Salt Brine at one time, we were gonna do a shared service. This is just an example with the county. Um, Everything was going to be set up in our yard, storage, making of it, and everything else like that. County came in and said, we come first before you, even on our own service that we were providing. So that's my experience with the county, and that's my experience with other municipalities. And I don't blame them because if we were to offer that shared service, naturally, at the same time, you try to be fair. But we are going to put our town before the other town, especially when it comes to our police cars, especially during the winter when we have snow and stuff. Um, we need to get our vehicles on back on just as quick as anybody else. So that's the issue that you end up having as far as with a shared service. There's been many things that we've looked at in the past and that was one of the biggest issues. Um, as far as adding additional staff, you are not going to know until we actually get this on the ground and running. That way we can figure out the ins and outs and everything else that we potentially might need. Ideal situation, two mechanics, that way you don't ever have to worry about it. That you can actually, you know, look into the future on that. But um, as far as adding staff, that would be the best case scenario. But right now, Adam and the DPW and Phil and them, would have to work out all the kinks and see how that's running before we would go down that road. So I hope that answers your question. Can I just add, I know I spoke to Andover and uh, Hardiston, and I know uh, somebody spoke to Hampton, and they are maxed out uh, with their um, mechanics and their workload that they would be unable to afford us shared services. And then the other issue if you know and i know other entities around the county are, are pretty much in the same position um the other thing is then we're running cars back and forth you know we need two people to go drop a car off we need two people to pick a car up and then like kenny you know just explained we would be last in line waiting for our cars and you know that's one of the priorities that i have is you know getting the cars back onto the road as soon as possible because 
you know, sometimes, you know, I, I like I said, I can afford one car to be down, but two cars to be down. I, I'm in, I'm in a jackpot and, uh, you know, I really need to get those cars up and running to, so officers can get the calls. So it may, from, from my perspective, um, you know, the, 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 the concepts being thrown around seem somewhat reasonable. Um, my, my only maybe concern here is that this seems like, you know, we, we, and this is not necessarily to anyone's fault on the staff that, you know, we were handed 25 questions today. This kind of, you know, a, a limited amount of time to not only answer, but then digest the information that was received. And a couple of questions that sort of stand out that we don't have answers to or weren't necessarily done were at least reaching out to the county to have a discussion, um, understanding that this is number eight. And then number seven, you know, reaching out to other municipalities, like, we, yes, we got information about, like, the setup, the structure of their towns, but I don't know that, you know, the, the actual explicit conversation of a shared service was had with all these towns. And if it was, that's, you know, that's perfectly fine. Um, it just wasn't incorporated in the answer. And then um, the other question that sort of stands out was, you know, the, uh, what number was it? It's one of these here. Uh, something along the, long, the, along the lines of reaching out to some of the other garages that, that exist in town. I mean, we had a great relationship with Boot and Tire for a really long time. Um, and you know, that's not to say that any of the other long-term garages that exist in town wouldn't also be able to provide a reasonable relationship. And it's not to say that they would. It's tough to say, but, you know, unless the conversation is had, and I think unless, you know, there's a little more time spent into researching all of the options, my personal comfort level would be to, to hang on a little bit if we can, do a little more research, get a little more comprehensive understanding of what all of the options are in order to say this is option one, this is option two, you know, there are a couple of different ways we can go. Because at least at the moment, it just seems like, you know, we're focused on the internal garage. We haven't really necessarily formally explored other options. We had a bad experience with Boot and Tire, which I'm not negating. Totally understand the, the background there, uh, Chief, you guys, that, that makes total sense. Um, just, you know, for my own you know, comfort, ability to, to vote on this, you know, knowing that we, you know, kind of made a, uh, you know, uh, handle all of our due diligence, per se, if you will. Um, you know, maybe maybe a little more investigation into alternative options so we can really kind of weigh our options and say, yes, firmly, this is definitely the, the best option, which it very well might be. Um, I just don't know that we have all the information to make that decision. That's my thought on it. Chief Van Newland, did was there anything that you wanted look like you had something to say? Just anything you wanted to add to, in response no, to that? No, thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. So I guess my question would be, um, kind of in response to that JP is that we have a person on staff capable to do the work and who's familiar with our fleet um, because he worked on them for several years or police cars for several years when he was employed with our former vendor. Um, so to me, when I look at the pros, um, you know, we've clearly said that there's an efficiency um, opportunity here um, with reducing and minimizing perhaps the the time that we have a um, a police car and other equipment off the road and the ability to enhance the work that's already currently being done by the DPW team mechanically because we have this other person that is hired for general DPW work but has this whole skill set of auto mechanics right in addition to um the opportunity to save money on parts alone by being um, a wholesale purchaser of those parts and saving on the cost per hour for not having to outsource the work to um, another for-profit facility or to the dealership, which probably is more expensive than a local mom and pop shop. So to me, it sounds like even if we were to entertain a conversation with another local shop that there would still be an increase in the cost that is being proposed to be saved by having it in-house by virtue of the skill set, the hourly wage, wage, and the cost of parts. Did I do that assessment properly, Chief? Yes. And, you know, like I kind of said before, that we are the anomaly in Sussex County. Every municipality has their own mechanic on staff. So, you know, we, we were very fortunate with Jay, 
And, you know, he was his pricing with parts and he was very, you know, flexible with his labor. There was, you know, times where he would, you know, do things and, you know, would just be like, I'll get you next time. So, uh, you know, that kind of mindset business models kind of gone now. Um, if the way to go, you know, would be outsourcing. I think a lot of municipalities would do that, but keeping it in house is such a cost savings across the board. You're, you're saving, I mean, it's a hundred dollars, uh, you know, at a local shop, it's probably about 120, 140 at a dealership. Um, and then, you know, you're paying a premium on parts. So, you know, it, it really, you know, and I respect, you know, the mayor's view on, you know, trying to go to other shops, um, but, you know, we do have the, the the cost, the labor, we do have the cost of parts, but then also, you know, we're, we're not going to be, you know, I'm not going to bring a police car there and say, hey, I need this in two hours. They're going to be like, yeah, okay, get in line. You know, we got other cars on the lift where, you know, before Jay was very accommodating. So, you know, and so that's, that's where we're at, unfortunately, um, you know. And we have the person on staff already. So even when there's not a repair to be made or a mechanic uh, mechanical issue, they're working on other assignments or other projects. So, I mean, the person's already on staff and has capacity. I mean, I, I understand one of the concerns was um, particularly this time of year, DPW is so extraordinarily busy um, because you have the added projects of, you know, summer and spring and, you know, was there really capacity? So I don't know if, you know, you wanted to speak to um, workload at all. But I mean, we are behind. <laughs> but on, but so you you annualize that, and it looks like it's but kind yeah, of as, too. As he's worked with us so far, when we've had mechanical stuff, he's already been working on it. And when we don't, he's out there doing the rest. What everybody else is doing, depending on what the need is that day. So, and can I also add in too, just so DPW didn't really utilize boot and tire like the police did. They didn't have lifts to equip our mason dumps and a lot of some, like smaller places can't we always have to go usually go to dealerships or bigger places for pretty much anything but our pickup trucks and even then sometimes you know we didn't really we used jay for certain things but we didn't use it for so the huge costs are the big cost savings and the are the opportunity for the big cost savings is, is really within the police department's mechanical budget which i think is what chief van Nolan said in the beginning or any administrative vehicles as well well, that's a good point, too. Any, yeah. Would it really be any vehicle the savings? Because you're saving average labor yeah. costs is about $128 an hour. Plus, when you go into a shop anymore, they hit you with a $200 at diagnostic fee right off the rip. Okay. They can hit you with that multiple times. So you're, you're saving that. You're saving the cost on the labor. You're saving the cost of the pot and the parts. You gain more control over what you're doing and how you can schedule at the same time. And that's a big thing because waiting is critical, not only for the police, but also for all of our departments, including code enforcement and everything else like that. If you have control, it's better than somebody else having control. We also have part our vehicles to other garages. I don't want to name the few, but at the same time, they weren't as accommodating and also at the same time, pricing was high. Right now, this is the most opportune time to have this discussion and to do this. We're looking, pretty much everybody, even personally I've talked to, is now looking for a reputable garage to take their vehicles to. Okay, right now we have a chance to bring this in the house, which not only helps us now, but it's gonna help us in the future at the same time. So to me, it's a it's a win-win. You have them on staff already. You continue to do the work. You have more control. You save over parts. You also save on time. He's right there. And to me, right now would be the time to do it. Mayor, just one other point. And Eric will back me up. I believe we need four votes for this based on the way the ordinance is written eric to confirm two-thirds well, that's correct so if respectfully the mayor and councilman dixon are not in favor then it's best to just let the ordinance die 
and move on. Because if there's not four votes in the affirmative, it won't pass this evening anyway. So I'm going to reiterate my perspective in saying that this all very well may end up being the best decision, but I think that we are tasked with making sure that we are making the right decision and without cost comparisons, speaking to other garages, I can't you know, say confirm, you know, confidently that we are absolutely making the best decision because I don't think I have all the information in front of me to say, yes, this is clearly the option. I don't know what other garages are charging. I don't know what the labor differences are. And again, I'm not negating anything that's been said. I'm not disagreeing with it. I'm just saying, I don't think we have enough information to very confidently say that, yes, we made the best decision when the taxpayer comes up and says, why did we do this? Did we make the right decision? And I think that we, we, we if, if we need to wait a month, if we need to have a, an additional meeting to push this along, to reappropriate it after we reintroduce it, I'm game for that. I have no problem with that. We can move it along, but I think I'd like to see a little more information. We had 25 questions asked today. We got answers back in the middle of the afternoon. I don't think anyone here had enough time to properly digest the information. At no fault of anyone here, no fault to the professionals, the questions were delivered today. There is one other alternative. Yeah, I mean, I I was at work, so I didn't I didn't I didn't even have a chance to 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 review all the, the answers to the questions. So, um, I mean, I'm I'm kind of along with the mayor's thinking of. I mean, I don't think that if we had to have another meeting, um, just to approve this, I I don't I don't think that that holding off necessarily is going to make or break what I mean. And the end result might be the best option. I just don't, I don't think it's going to make or break it, whether we gather more information first. No, I understand that, Matt, but I just want to state for the record that we did receive the questions today and the staff did work expeditiously to turn around the answers. So I just want to make sure that that's on the record, that the staff did respond to any questions as quickly as they were <laughs> sent over. And it was recognized and thoroughly appreciated. Thank you. Yes. There is an alternative. The alternative is closed. The public hearing this evening continue the matter until the July 15th meeting. It does not require an additional notice. And hopefully you all get your questions answered and you can vote on the ordinance on July 15th. I think that's very reasonable. I think it's reasonable. Which requires right. a motion to close the public hearing. I entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. I'll second. Roll call. Roll call, please. Mr. Dixon. What are we roll calling, Eric? Oh, yes. close it, closing the public hearing only. Usually the mayor does that without a roll call. Well, I did. Yeah. So. I want to make sure it's for the purpose of the record. That's fine. The hearing, the public hearing is now. The public hearing is closed, and therefore the matter is continued till July 15th at 7 p.m. We assume thereafter the matter may be heard without further notice, almost like a planning board. For those of you who have heard those words uttered before. Recently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you very much, Adam, Kenny, Debbie, whoever else, Tom. Steve. Steve. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. The chief, my goodness. All right, we'll move to the next ordinance, which is Ordinance 2024-18. A bond ordinance providing a supplemental appropriation of $80,000 for the installation of HVAC system at Town Hall in and by the Town of Newton in the County of Sussex, New Jersey, and authorizing the issuance of $76,000 worth of bonds or notes of the town financing part of the appropriation. I will now open the hearing to the public. If anyone in person would like to speak, please step forward. If anyone on Zoom would like to speak, please indicate so by raising your hand. Uh, yes, I've got Dr. Makaj. Dr. Makaj. Yes, Dr. Makaj. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, in conjunction with uh, what you said before about trying to save the taxes and you, you, you try to, to give some fancy numbers out there, 
and uh, to make that more easy for the public to understand. In the end of the uh, opening public statement, I'm going to say something, but in, in regard to the $80,000, uh, putting that towards the age vault. And I understand that I have a big sympathy for those people that couldn't work on that big heat out there. I mean, if it's hot, it's hot. But air conditioning uh, is um, a kind of, I cannot say luxury, but uh, not everybody has air conditioning in their home. There are other ways, you know, to make, uh, uh, to be a little more frugal of maintaining, um, I mean, directing this town in the right direction and cutting those taxes, starting, starting even on these simple things here. Uh, again, in the end, I'm going to bring to you an example so then you can understand better my point since probably my accent does not make that easy. But about the, um, this HVAC so far, how have you dealt with, uh, with this, uh, I mean, um, uh, what type of system you have used that now you need to spend so much money. Uh, knowing the fact that uh, we are really uh, suffering from every time tax raise and tax raise, tax raise, when we can divert ourselves uh, thinking in better way, finding um, basically learning how to live uh, 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 in frugal way, probably, because these are our, I mean, our condition. We cannot um, spend so much money out there hiring new jobs, hiring new people, when there are ways of cutting, let's say cutting the positions, being more productive on our work in the daily. So to me, I don't know, maybe this is necessarily for you guys, 80,000 for the HVOC, but 10, 10 years ago, I mean, there are households out there. They still are with the windows, air conditioner out there. So now to me, facing my taxes doubled and you try not to understand that, or I don't know, maybe you didn't understand that. And now seeing here, because I have an ordinance with $80,000 because it's very hot in a building that it is with brick, and then keeps the heating very nicely. Maybe you should put some blinders, heavy blinders out there, and then keep the temperature nicely. Because I'm concerned about the taxes very much. You try to give some good answers out there, dear mayor, but I'll reserve my answers to you in another time. Your time Maybe is up. So I'm against that for now. Thank you, Dr. McCodge. If anyone else on Zoom would like to speak, please indicate so by raising your hand. I don't see anyone else, Mayor. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing. Entertain a motion to act on the ordinance. Oh, I will offer ordinance 2024-18 um, for approval, uh, because I do not think that our staff should be in a building that does not have air conditioning um, and gets to be 86 or 92 degrees is what I think it was on Friday afternoon when I was on a phone call here with staff working here. So um, I respectfully disagree with Dr. McCaj that air conditioning for this building is a luxury uh, and want to move the ordinance, please. Is there a second? I will second ordinance 2024-18. Thank you, second. Michelle beat you, Matt. Sorry. Any discussion? Any other discussion? Sure. All right. uh, Mr. Russo, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just perhaps provide a little context since you were here at the building, uh, the, the temperature that was present in the building and what other mitigating factors may have been installed to potentially reduce the temperature and, and how, if any effect that had. Sure. We have two different systems on the town hall side. One is providing the comfort for the room that you're currently in and the uh, the other system runs the rest of the building thursday we had to close early at 1 p.m because of the excessive heat in the building friday staff had to work remotely some of us terry myself cat and others were in the building and it was one temperature at 7 30 8 30 in the morning and it, the, it was a dramatic increase in the temperature so 
no use of fans and blinds and other things prevents the town hall side of the building from going dramatically up in terms of temperature. It's an older system. Council has already approved the bulk of the appropriation through the budget process. This is a supplemental appropriation of additional funds based on the work that Corey's office is doing um, on the design and soon to go out to bid. So as much as I understand where Ludmilla is coming from, it's a professional office building and the staff needs to be able to work without heat exhaustion or heat stroke, you know, then we'll have other issues. So, you know, we've gotten as many years out of the system as we can because we are frugal and we are penny penny wise, but this is one of those times where we need to invest in the future system. And it is a specialty system, though it, it is a custom system. So there's a lot of design work that Corey's office is working on with the subcontractor and it won't be ready for this summer, unfortunately, but we'd like to get it installed so that the building is taken care of for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also believe that as public employees, there are OSHA standards that require certain temperatures to be maintained in the building. So um, if we're not able to maintain those temperatures, we are now in violation of health standards. Um, and as such, you know, it would probably cost the taxpayers more if the employees started suing us for having a hot building that was in excess of what the requirements were. So any further discussion? All right, roll call, please. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Diglio. Yes. Mrs. LaFoy. Yes. Mrs. Teets. Yes. Mayor Coos. Yes. Move to ordinance 2024-19. In ordinance to amend, revise, and supplement the town code of the town of Newton, most notably chapter 228 entitled Water and Sewer, by adding a new article 10 in section 228-32 entitled Lead Service Line Replacement. I'll now open the hearing to the public. Anyone in person, step up to the microphone. If you'd like to speak, anyone on Zoom, please indicate so by raising your hand. I don't see any, oh, wait a minute. That doctor, no, oh, wait a minute. Two. I've got two, yeah. yeah. I've got Dr. Makaj and Joe B. So Dr. Makaj. I think you can start for, first with the other person and then uh, I'll say after something. You can start with the other guy. Okay. Hi, it's uh, it's Margaret Baldini, Ken Barrylane. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Um. So regarding this um ordinance, I I I want to reiterate my complaints of earlier. Um. I think this, uh, the fees that you're going to uh charge for the penalties, if somebody doesn't comply, seem excessive. Uh, there's a section there where you're adding an administrative fee uh, for every quarterly bill until it's, you know, in perpetuity, possibly. Uh, there's no limit on it whatsoever. And it just seems like excessive to threaten people with possible jail time for that. And that's all. Thank you. All right, Dr. Makaj. Yes, as I am, uh, as a matter of fact, and uh, I'm sorry, I haven't done too much homework about this ordinance uh, because I've been working a lot, but uh, I have a few questions. And I do understand that this is important because it's a lead and it's not healthy and needs to be done. And as uh, spoken before, which I didn't know it was, um, Baldini, so thank you for uh, the input. Um, I know that you have uh, a race on on the tax uh, on the water bill, uh, a fee that uh, whatever you want to make that up for the money that you are going to spend. And again, my concern it is is any as she said, is any deadline for that to make up, and then uh, you go back 
Meaning, again, we do not want to be thrown not only the high taxes, but also increase the uh, fees for the water and for the sewer when really we live in a time and the world of inflation. As, and I do understand this as, as, I, as much as I understand what the mayor said, violation of the health standard, think about when a, 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 a person like, like me, for example, uh, and I try to be frugal, not to use my air conditioner, to save my money, and then in the other side, I will pay for the, for the workers, workers there so they can have the facility to, which I understand is normal. I want to, to, to have a good condition out there. But how about you raising the taxes out there and making our life miserable? And we try to be frugal out there. But yet, I need to pay for you guys. So this is which really make me a little, not that easy to, to agree with such a spending out there. Again, as I said, we need to be frugal in the way that how we dirigent this town. One minute. And yet I am worried because when my water bill came very high, yes, I'm shaking. I'm shaking as I see my taxes doubled in a very wrongful way, which I'm going to prove to you is wrong. But again, I'm giving you the time to give me some answers out there. And I'd like you to look a little more into when you make a decision, when you approve something, really you've got to think on our shoes. You are voted by us. That's all for now. Thank you, Dr. Mercado. Anyone else on Zoom? I don't see anyone else. Thank you. I'll close the hearing to the public. I entertain a motion to act on Ordinance 2024-19. I'll offer to Ordinance 2024-19. I will second. Is there any discussion? I think it should be known that this is a state mandate and we do not have a choice as far as the matter goes, as far as the lead. It has been state mandated. Obviously, the state does not intend to pay. However, it is a state mandate. I also believe that there is precedent at the state level with the Trenton Water Works, where the Department of Environmental Protection has filed a lawsuit against the city of Trenton for not addressing and remediating their levied service lines. So if the state is imposing the mandate, albeit an unfunded, partially unfunded, a uh, difficult to find funded measure um, that they are then going to sue or levy a lawsuit against the town for, uh, the town I think then stands at in a position to lose more money than it would potentially cost to mitigate the circumstance if the state is going to then sue us and the taxpayers would be on the hook for settling that lawsuit. I don't know if Mr. Bernstein has any additional. Your Honor, the, the two provisions that the speakers claim or commented on are one, the failure to give us access to their homes to take an action or possibly address whether or not they have a letter galvanized service line. They can very easily avoid that issue by simply providing us with the necessary paperwork to show that their lines either are or are not letter galvanized steel and how they're going to address them, or that they aren't letter galvanized steel and then there's no need to have access. This is only for the refusal to grant and the refusal to provide. As Councilwoman Diglio indicated, this is a state mandate. This is actually more a federal mandate coming down through the state. And while there may be money available, that's another issue to be dealt with. As for the last provision, that's a court decision. The town is not imposing any penalties on anybody, whether it's fee, whether it's fines, time in, in jail or community service. That violation of this ordinance and actions taken by the municipal court, which generally will not happen unless we are left with no other alternatives whatsoever in order to obtain our own avoidance of litigation such as the mayor indicated in Trenton. Thank you. So maybe to just reiterate, there are alternatives. You do not have to provide us access. You do not have to grant access to the town. You just have to provide whatever sufficient information demonstrates that you either don't have 
lead or galvanized steel lines or have a plan to mitigate them yourselves. And that you have mitigated them. And that you have mitigated them. Thank Mayor, you. one other point. Yes. If I may, thank you. It, you know, there are communities that are passing along the expense mm -hmm. to the property owners. We made the conscious decision when we drafted the ordinance that because it was a state mandate, we didn't want to be punitive and put the cost and the onus on the property owners. So that's why the ordinance has the dual provision that if the person has the work done and follows the parameters of the ordinance and the application, they can provide the information to the municipality and we can provide reimbursement or in the alternative, we will go out and we will get a vendor and we will have the work done and we will document. And it's a, you know, it's a health and safety and welfare issue. And the goal is as we determine the number of properties that are impacted by the lead or galvanized steel that the municipality has the ability to go out and seek state or federal grant funding that maybe homeowners might not have normally have access to. So as much as I appreciate Ludmilla and Peggy's comments, the town is going way beyond what some other towns are doing. And it's going to cost a lot of money if there's hundreds or thousands, probably not thousands, but there potentially will be hundreds of properties impacted and each on average will be 10 to 15,000. So do the math. This is a six or seven figure commitment on the part of the municipality, but we're doing it because we know that it's a health issue for a lot of people potentially. And that's why we recommended the ordinance the way that it's written. And Mr. Russo, thank you for bringing that up. And I wanted to just underscore and emphasize the point that you made. Um, not only is this federally and state mandated, not only is there precedence if we don't comply by a certain date, the clock is running on that. I think we had a 10 year mandate um, and the clock is already running, but we had several conversations about the pros and cons of the town having to do this and the cost that was going to be incurred. And we unilaterally um, said that this was not something we wanted to pass on to the taxpayers to the tune of ten dollars to $15,000 at a minimum for each taxpayer, um, household or resident that may have a lead baseline running to their home. And so looking at the opportunity to craft an ordinance that was both taxpayer user friendly and allowed the town, as you mentioned, to, per to, per to pursue future grant funding to offset the costs um, I think, as, as I believe the rest of the council and our professionals, that this is a more than fair, very well-crafted ordinance. And as council has indicated, compliance is very simple. And because we are being held to potential ramifications, costly ramifications um, from the powers that be above us, we needed to put in there um, some lines to indicate what would happen if there was non-compliance. So the compliance issue is very simple and we've provided two opportunities either at the direction of the homeowner or through the schedule of the town to remedy the situation to no cost to the taxpayer. And I just wanted to emphasize, underline and underscore that because I don't think that um, there is knowledge out there that this very simply as there is being done by other municipalities throughout the state um, could have been passed on directly to the taxpayers with a mandate that the work be done um, in short order and, you know, utilizing the contractors that we pick. So um, I just wanted to add a little more color to that conversation as well. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? All right. Roll call, please. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Diglio? Yes. Mrs. LaFoy? Yes. Mrs. Teets? Yes. Mayor Coos? Yes. And I move to the introduction of Ordinance 2024-20, a bond ordinance amending bond ordinance number 2023-8, finally adopted by the Town Council of Town of Newton, New Jersey, on April 24th, 2023. I'll entertain a motion to introduce. Before we make the motion, um, I read the ordinance. And from April of 20, April 24, 2023 to now, the cost for this has gone up four hundred and thirty five hundred thousand dollars 
I would like to know why growth hasn't been started and why the cost keeps going up because this is not the first increase that we've had on this particular, on these projects for water and sewer. This has been going on for several years. So procedurally, it should be introduced and then discussed? Motion, second, then discussion. Okay. So one moment. Is there a, 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 I understand a motion to introduce? I'll make the motion to introduce ordinance 2024-20. Is there a second? Second. Now, whoever would like to answer Sandy's question. I'll defer to Monica or Kenny if they want to jump in on the status of the particular projects that are referenced in the ordinance. Okay. Um, I believe, and I'm not 100%, but the ordinance is covering, um, it looks like one, two, actually three total projects. Um, the We've had increases A in cost. Um, just naturally through just process of material, delivery costs, manufacturing and everything else like that. But also we have increases in um, engineering, which has somewhat to do with going through the New Jersey I-Bank because the New Jersey I-Bank requires a certain amount of engineering on their own besides the design phases of the project. So I believe that's where your increases are. Um, we've already had a bid opening on one project and it was substantially more than what we anticipated um, because of labor materials and um, things like that on top of the extra engineering that New Jersey iBank is requiring at the, at the same time. So that's where a lot of these increases are. And my concern, though, is we have been working on these projects for several years now. Correct. We've known about them. We've been working on them. The engineers have been working on them. And the longer it's delayed, the higher the cost is going. And that's not fair to the taxpayers. No, I'm not yeah. going to disagree yeah. with you. Right, but Sandy, we have so many projects going on right now. Tens of millions of dollars between water and sewer. The engineers are working as fast as they can. Monica is working as fast as she can on funding and financing. I understand the concern, but the the amount of time and money being spent to move these along is insane. It's not a fault of anybody on the staff. It's they're working. There's so many projects in the queue. There's been delays with iBank funding. There's been delays with vendors. There's been problems with bids. There's been problems with estimates. It's universal across the board, not just unique to Newton. So that there's no there's no fault lying with any of the staff or the professionals. They're working as fast as they can, doing things the right way. And we have three, you know, we have Fred Margron working on projects. We have Sean Sorter working on projects. Monica's working on financing. Tom Ferry will be working on financing. They're working as fast as they can. I do have a positive comment under NJIB. Newton is a small water system. We have under 10,000 users and we can apply for up to a million of principal forgiveness. Well, that's good news. Yeah. Uh -huh. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Dixon. 
Yes. Mrs. Diglio. Yeah. Mrs. LaFoy. Yes. Mrs. Teets. Yes. Mayor Coos. Yes. The public hearing on the above uh, ordinance will be held on Monday, July 15th at 7 p.m. Thank you. We'll now move to our final introduction. Uh, ordinance 2024-21, an ordinance providing funding for various improvements to the water supply and distribution system for the water treatment plant for the town of Newton and appropriating $21,267.72 for such purpose. I'll entertain a motion to introduce. I will uh, make the motion to introduce ordinance 2024-21. I will second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Diglio. Yes. Mrs. Lapois. Yes. Mrs. Teets. Yes. Mayor Coos. Yes. And the public hearing on that one. Oh, sorry. The public hearing on the above orders will be held Monday, July 15th at 7 p.m. Thank you. We'll now move to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and non-controversial by the town council and will be approved by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. Mr. Russo, if you wouldn't mind a rundown, please. Sure, 179. Um, question for Eric, 179 relates to the auto shop, so you might want to get direction from Eric on 179. 180 is agreement for administrative agent services for affordable housing. 181, renewal of club license. 182, renewal of retail distribution license. 183, retail consumption license renewal. 184, retail consumption license renewal. 185, retail consumption license renewal. 186 cancels appropriated reserve balance thirty dollars sixty cents. One eighty seven contract award disclosure contract for enforces. One eighty eight contract firefighter one for fire department turnout gear and bailout systems. One eighty nine. One ninety. One ninety one. One ninety two. One ninety three are all chapter one fifty nines either for animal control or zoning. One ninety four is payment number three for Memory Park. One ninety four change order number three for Memory Park. One ninety six. Amendment to Water Sewer Capital Budget, 197, Vacation Time Payout for Monica, 198 is the grant application for Mount View Street, Palmer Street, and Trinity Street resurfacing project, and bills and vouchers, 199. Thank you. There are uh, any items that anyone would like to remove, and how would you like us to address 179? I would ask that the governing body remove resolution 179-2024 and continue it to the July 15th meeting. All right, uh, I'll entertain a motion to table resolution so 170. Want table, just, it's, it was just carrying carry. it. All right, a motion to carry resolution 179 2024 to the July 15th, 2024 meeting. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Roll call. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Diglio? Yes. Mrs. LaFoy? Yes. Mrs. Teets? Yes. Mayor Coos? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Any, uh, any other item that someone would like to remove? All right, not hearing any. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda uh, without resolution 170. I will offer the consent agenda uh, without resolution 179-2024, all others as listed. I will second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Diglio. Yes. Mrs. LaFoy. Yes. Mrs. Teets. Yes. Mayor Coos. Uh, yes, with abstentions on check number 11059, 11071, 72, and 73. I think I said yes. Uh, yes. yes. All right. We'll now move to the second open to the public session. Uh, anyone in person who would like to speak, please step to the microphone. Three minutes apply. State your name for the record.
Hi. My name is Jessica Valero, and I'm requesting an executive session after the meeting, please. And I'm waiving my race notice. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else in person would like to speak? All right. And I see anyone in person, anyone on Zoom would like to speak, please indicate so by raising your hand. Okay. We've got Dr. Makaj. Dr. Makaj. Yes. Hi again. Uh, apparently, it looks like I may have been not clear with my uh, first of the opening to the public. So uh, this time, my question is going to be straightforward. Is going to be for the mayor and probably for the other panelists to understand. I understand what the manager said. He, uh, already I did say that um, uh, I started to contact the town. I had the opportunity today to speak with the tax collector, but it was not too much help out there. I guess um, maybe there is um, a discordance on probably on our way of calculation or education or etc. So my question is going to be very simple. You have two houses, Mr. Mayor. One assessed one million, the other half million. Yet in the end, whether it is the group of um, uh, deciding the final amount of the tax gave for the one which is assessed half of million, more taxes than the one with one million. Now my question, so just picture this, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to give you names now, neither the, the address of the properties, because I like to do my homework and to bring you batches of those next time in person. But my question is very simple. Does it sound fair to you or right? Very simple, answer yes or not. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Makaj. Anyone else on Zoom would like to speak? Please indicate so by raising your hand. I don't see anybody else raising their hands, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I'll add an opportunity for council manager comments if anyone would like to address Dr. Makaj. So Dr. Makaj, I'll just reiterate that um, you know, without knowing the specifics of the circumstance, it's difficult to make an assessment. It's also not our role to set your assessment or to appeal your assessment or to negotiate your assessment. We have professionals to do that. And if you're dissatisfied with the tax collector, tax assessor, the opportunity exists to appeal your assessment to the County Board of Taxation. We'll now move to a discussion. Uh, we have a presentation this evening from uh, DeFeo Associates regarding garbage and recycling services in the town of New. Yeah, if I could jump in there and have Wayne come up next to Eric. Please. All right. So one of the goals that the council had set was a uh, investigation of garbage services. I had mentioned to the mayor and deputy mayor that um, Corey had done some work. So Corey's there as well looking into various options. And I know Deb Danielson had done some investigation gative work previously and we were you know kind of hitting some roadblocks candidly because the taxpayers are currently obtaining private garbage services through a subscriber based model and many are taking their refuse to the county facilities so we weren't really seeing economies of scale or any value from an economic standpoint but in fairness to the council it was something that they wanted you know to pursue or at least investigate. So just by chance, um, I had gone to the municipal manager's conference, the mini conference back in May, and Wayne was one of the uh, primary speakers, and I was very impressed with his knowledge. Uh, they don't call him Mr. Solid Waste for nothing. Um, true story. And I just wanted to give a little bit of his background and then ask uh, Wayne to speak all things refuse. So Wayne is the principal and founder of DeFeo Associates. It's a full service environmental consulting business, and they've done all kinds of work for environmental sustainability, energy reduction strategies, recycling, solid waste. He's got a bachelor's of science in biology and a master of arts in environmental studies from Montclair State University. 
certified teacher of science and lead accredited and he's won numerous awards for his work as it relates to state recycling programs um, and refuse management and I just was real impressed with Wayne and all joking aside he really is considered the seminal expert as it relates to solid waste and recycling in in the state so it was really a great opportunity to learn from him um, different options that may be may or may not be available if the council majority wishes to go in a certain direction and give me some additional guidance or wishes me to pivot off of this project. So I thought Wayne could come in, talk about his experience, his background, and then the council can throw some questions at him regarding garbage and recycling services. We did try to provide as much information on recycling. Um, the mayor had a bunch of questions today, so I made sure that the staff uh, tried to put together as much in information today in a timely fashion. And with that, I'll turn it over to Wayne. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, members of the public. I was asked to come up to give you somewhat of a background and overview. And we'll start by saying subscription service is the most common service in New Jersey geographically. Most of the state's municipalities are covered by subscription service. The larger percentage of the population is covered by municipal service because municipal service is typically engaged in in larger communities where you have higher density of population, more people, and therefore the municipality generally provides that service. It's a historic service in most urban areas or suburban areas, whereas as I say, in most semi-rural or rural areas, you're on subscription. I'm on subscription where I live and I'm in Somerset County now which you would no longer call rural, and it is suburban. It is a common practice. It is one that towns look at carefully what is less expensive for their residents. Uh, Manager Russo did make a comment that there's an economy of scale, typically, when a municipality goes to bid. In many cases, and in other communities where I've done studies for them, and they were trying to decide the same thing you're looking at tonight, should we do this or should we go to municipal bid? As a general rule, and understand there are no absolutes in this business at all. The only absolutes in this business are that prices will go up and that we will all die someday. Those are the only things I can tell you for sure and with any certainty. And we used to be saying death and taxes, right? In that municipality, we did find that it was a big municipality in Somerset County, about 25,000 homes, a little bit larger than Newton. It would have been cheaper had they gone to municipal service and they rejected that option. And they rejected that option because, and again, at that time, remember, when it was paid for under municipal service as a general part of your tax rate, it was also a federal tax deduction because your property taxes were able to be deducted more easily than today. Things have changed mathematically. When you go to a municipal service, you have a uniform service, which means there are very few options for homeowners or for taxpayers. And by that, I mean, once it's bid, let's just hypothetically put out a bid if you're going to collect garbage one time per week, that one time per week will include X gallons of garbage, whatever that is. It may or may not include bulk waste collection. It may or may not include collection of electronics, yard waste, recycling, or any combination of things you wish to do, then it is literally the same for every homeowner. Under a subscription system, of course, every homeowner can decide what they want to buy. In my case, I, we buy the most limited service we can buy, but that means if I want to put something outside of my can, we use wheeled carts, then I must pay. I have to call my contractor and pay for that. In most municipal government, that cost is spread over every home. Give you an example. I'm working, in fact, this will be a much more pleasant meeting than my Wednesday night meeting, where we are discussing which bid option to actually award. You want to come do that one for me? <laughs> in that option, in that situation, it's a large suburban urban community. They have an existing level of service that's been that way since when asked the question when, as long as we can remember. And to contain cost, 
they're having to make a decision to whether, whether or not to cut service. Wow. And I know in your position on that side of the dais, that is the least popular term you ever want to hear is cutting service for somebody. Well, the only way to contain cost in bidding for solid waste services, and I'm counting solid waste with everything I said, even though recycling is a different, slightly different beast. Know that in the past five years, the price has gone up in every community that is bidding between 34 and 150%. Hmm. In one community that we have worked with in Southern Jersey, it is urban, a large city, their price went from 2.4 million to 9.9 .9 million dollars. Hmm. Now, they have no option. In a situation like that, you must have a municipal service. It would be insane to have four garbage companies coming through a major urban area on any schedule they like to do that kind of work. But I want to give you some scale. The other thing we've noted in municipal bidding is that there are fewer companies bidding. And there, you may have read in the paper or seen on local news, there are a number of statements to the effect that have been made Oh, there's bid rigging, there is collusion. That's not the case. This is probably, as an industry in New Jersey, one of the most litigious industries I've ever dealt with. They tend, garbage companies that lose contracts tend to sue very quickly. And in fact, in the latest case in the major city in Patterson, it went all the way to the appellate division because the losing contractor had been there for a number of years. And that's not to say that's not the right thing to do. It's just to tell you, this, the reason for a lack, if you will, or less competition stems from a number of factors. One, towns want too much service and they don't want to pay for it. Secondly, there are companies leaving the business, some generationally, where it's just, I don't want to sell it, I'm done, I've done this for 30 years, I'm retired. Some because of economics, COVID, as you know, Better, we all know, hurt everybody in many ways, shape, and form. Well, in that industry, it hurt them because it raised prices, just like it has for all of us. And it's also cut the labor pool. And like everywhere else in the state, finding people to do the work is not something that's easy. Whether you were to do the work in-house, and I'm not suggesting that either, and say, I'm going to hire all my own folk to do this, or I'm going to bid it, those companies aren't having as easy, as easy a time as you might think of hiring people, mm -hmm. and for several reasons. Some of the hardest working people are on the back of those trucks. In a private company, it's estimated that they are to do 600 stops a day. You pick up a 50-pound can 600 times. You're going to be tired. I'd be dead. You'd be tired. Mm -hmm. Injury rates are extraordinarily high especially when bulk waste is considered, couches, furniture, things of that nature, which many communities have provided over the years. They don't want to give it up, but it's expensive to run. As you may or may not be aware, workman's compensation claim today is anywhere from 150 dollars to $250,000 per claim. And you probably know this in your own town. Well, who pays for that? When you go to bid, you pay for that. That's built into the bid. It's assumed they're going to have so many claims over the life of a contract, and they amortize that over the homes. It's a lot to think about, I know. Subscription service, it's an older form of service. It's what we all had. It's what everybody had at one point until New York City, not to give it too much history, decided to do municipal collection in the 1800s. There was a logic to that, but again, a different setting than here. I've had the pleasure of living in Sussex County, and I had my sticker to go to the landfill like everybody else in my town at that time had. And that's a convenience I can tell you just does not exist in most locations. It's a convenience. Now, of course, if you're willing to provide your own labor and bring the garbage to another location. That's probably the cheapest path you could take. And that's something to consider as well. You have limited providers in Sussex County. And you can speak to that better than I at this point because you've just done another bid. And that's going to impact the level of service. 
you're also, and it's a wonderful thing that Newton's a small town. But it also is the kind of thing that says, can I service it effectively if I'm a small company? My trucks, you could do Newton. If you do once a week collection, I could probably pick up Newton with two trucks over the course of the week. But I've tied up two trucks for a very small contract. It may not be of interest to me to bid. That's another reason you're not, you're not seeing the bids you normally used to see. When we can see multiple bidders, it does help the pricing structure. In another community, we did have three good bids and good prices, and we were able to get some competitive numbers down. But it's a bit of a gamble. I don't know what you're paying individually, of course, if you have for your subscription service. Obviously, I have no way of knowing that. But numbers around the state can vary depending, again, on level of service. Do you want, and some communities do, want rear yard collection where people will come up the driveway and take the cans, dump them and put them back. You can have that. You can probably buy it today if you want it on your private subscription service for a fee if you want to do it. When that's been done in bid structures, we've often gotten complaints because it's expensive. You know, you know pretty much a luxury service except in very certain circumstances. You need to consider that carefully. I don't know that on my my initial instinct, I, don't, I have not done a study. I don't have study numbers in front of me. We don't have all of the data. I know you're very large on data here. You like to know what the data is. That makes perfect sense. But on its initial face, I'm not sure what's wrong with the system you have today. So I'm not certain that I would say on a gut level, on an initial professional level, certain that you need to change it. That's just, that doesn't mean yes or no. It just means on the data I have in front of me today, I don't see what you need to do that's different. I don't know how many haulers exactly, because I understand only have two, maybe three haulers servicing Newton right now. We'd have Blue Diamond, right, would be one. We yeah, have at least three that I'm aware of. Sanico, uh, Sanico, uh, uh, Man. Waste Management, and Blue Diamond. Right. And Sanico is probably going to be going out of business. Jim's getting ready to retire. I'll be. So I'm not certain which way you want to go with that. Uh, two, waste management's been up here forever. I've never understood why, but they, they're the largest company in the world that does that work, but they have been up here for a long time. And they have bid other contracts in the past. Uh, did they bid? The one I, I did one this year, the only, the end up only had one bid. Now I know waste management, for example, is not typically bidding any contracts that are not cart-based, and if that contract includes bulk waste, they have generally said we will walk away from those contracts. They'd rather make, they're a profit-minded company that doesn't like to take a lot of risk. And bulk is high risk, low reward if you're in the hauling business because of the injury rate, obviously. You're only going to get one bidder, potentially, and that depends on how you rate the bid. What services you want? How many options you want? As I've stated in many cases, sometimes towns go to bid and they think it's a big fishing case. Let's have 10 options. Not a good idea. Mm -hmm. You need to know what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. I say in my experience, which is now longer than I care to admit, uh, it has, I've seen this come and go and I see waves. And I'll say, oh, we're going to take it in-house because it's cheaper. No, we're going to get rid of it because it's cheaper. No, we're going to stay on subscription because it's more convenient, or we're going to go to bid. And just so you know, what that means is there is no one formula here. You have to decide what's best for your community. I can't tell you that on this face. But I know you have some more statistics. Did you want to provide them? or Well, I, I can give the council a little bit of information. I'm not sure how much detail you want right now, but the, the backup information you could provide was very valuable. I think the uh, some of the questions, the comments I have is basically, and it's public information. We, we did the bid over and you know, wrote the specifications for the bid that was in Sparta this past year. Okay, They have a lot more units. They got 7,000 residential units here in the neighborhood, around 2,200, I believe. Um, they they did four options. One was a solid waste collection. They do twice a week recyclables once a week, and they gave them a different option for single stream or dual stream. 
single stream, you mix everything to, you know, dumb it down for me. It's just, you, you mix everything together. The dual stream, you, you have separate, you know, pickups. And they did a three-year option and then a five-year option. You know, so it really, really came out. They had two options. One was the, you know, the, the garbage collection twice a week with recyclables, single stream. The second one, twice a week, recyclables, dual stream. And they had three, you know, those first two options for three years and the other one were for a five-year uh, contract. They decided to go with a five-year contract. Single stream was a little bit more expensive, but you got to go through the education of trying to have everybody in your town go on from single stream for, you know, the last five plus years and moving over to dual stream, the education that, that they didn't think it was you know, worth that option. So they kept it uh, similar to what they had. But I think this seems to be, from what you're stating, it seems to kind of on the Cadillac version. You know, well, it, it's a nice design. service. It, it's a good service. You're, uh, you're paying about, I did the quick math based on your numbers that you gave me earlier, about $35 a month per household ball, ballpark. Yeah. And that that's not too much different than single, uh, I'm sorry, than subscription. It dep again, depending on what service you want. I mean, obviously, you, have, you can have more. I would add to this, however, and an important point. If you choose to go to municipal contract, then the Kelly Law, which you're probably familiar with, will kick in. And every apartment and condominium will need to be covered by this contract. Or, in the converse, you must reimburse that community for their own service at a rate comparable to what you were paying for everything else. That gets to be, can be contentious with apartments and condominiums, especially with condominium owners. And it is something you need to consider because it will, how you choose to do that work is totally up to you. So if you have an apartment, which you do, of course, you have some high, high rise apartments. Those are typically going to be dumpster service. That's not what you typically provide to a, a single family home. And so you need to start thinking about how would I reimburse those units as well? You'd need to get an exact count of apartments. You'd need to know what kind of service they're getting. What are they paying today? But right now, you have no reason to know it because it doesn't impact you at all. As for recycling collection, how do you want to go about doing that? Do you want to keep it single stream? Do you want to go to dual stream? All of these come into play. And lastly, if you're going, if you're even going to consider this at all, you need to then look at the cost of carts. A cart system, if you're going to do a system, in this, I tell any town I work with and work with them on, is they need to look at carts. They're cleaner, neater, easier to deal with. Most private haulers either provide a cart, not all, uh, or they ask you to provide a cart, uh, depending on where you are. Depends on where you live. You don't have it. I, no, I have a. I live outside the, in Frankfurt. We, we do not have you know, the private subscription. The, we do not. It's a number of you know, cans were allowed. You know, so many, you know, the, so many, uh, you know, gallon cans per week. But you know, for this option here, you know, they they basically, you know, um, the item that they had, they were allowed to have uh, three thirty-two gallon, you know, cans per week. They were just doing cans, not mm -hmm. to, But they, but the, when I you know, called uh, at least that contractor, you know, the information of what you know they they recommended moving over to a five year program, so they they call them totes. Mm -hmm. Toter. Toters are it's a brand. the big big garbage pits. That's what I see it as, um, and that's what's where the you know, I think that's where the you know, the trucks pick them up and dump them. It, it can be a truck can pick it up, or it can, yes, a truck picks it up, and it can be fully automated or semi automated. And there are so many different things to think about. I can say probably with some level of certainty, without ever having seen this bid. That waste manager probably did not bid it because it is manual collection. They did not. And, and they don't want to do manual collection. Again, it's hard to find staff. When you go to automated or semi-automated, you reduce your staff needs on the truck. You reduce your staff injuries on the truck. Mm -hmm. And those are all factors that come into play. I in the total number of 30, if I said that right, 35 a month plus or minus, that that's that's not the cheapest I've seen. It's not the most expensive I've seen. It's right kind of in the middle of the ballpark. The lowest would be maybe 18 a month, but that's higher density, yeah. right? Homes really close together. So even though there are more homes, they can be serviced more quickly. Those came out about $425 a year. Back it down to the month. It's around yep. $35 a month. Now, they, they also had, they did have a bulk pickup as well. So the, that to me is luxurious. Yeah, so they had the bulk pickup as well. So that. That was an item that you say that a lot of companies are going away from. Companies are going away from, and I encourage towns to either do away with it 
or do it by reservation on a very limited frequency. Because it's, again, it's very expensive. And at least some studies that we've done in one town I worked with, they went to reservation and they found in the first month, they had 57 calls out of 7,000 homes. Yeah. Now you're paying, and if you just say, let's just do it for everybody, that truck's running around the whole town to do nothing. It really is a very inefficient means. Can you imagine if UPS just drove around all day long, not delivering on a route, they'd be out of business. It's the same logic in reverse. And that's why I say you have to be careful. Yeah, the other piece of information here, I do, do not have the dollar amounts, what it costs you, you know, for, you know, the town of Newt, they handle your own, you know, uh, recycles. Um, I assume everybody at the ASA understands, you know, your own program, you break it down into four zones. Um, and, um, and this is the information I went over with, with some of the items with Adam and Deb. You you have four zones, every zone is picked up on a, you know, basically once a month. So you have your recycles on you know, once every month it's being picked up. So that's a, you know, that's definitely a different, you know, a different situation than what these these contracts are providing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that dollar amount comes to because uh, mm -hmm. as we were talking to, I was talking, to, uh, uh, looking at this today, you have, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, uh, Adam, you have two, you know, in your zones, your larger zones, you have two trucks that uh, go out the day, you have two employees, that they're, you know, basically committed for almost the entire day, correct? So that's, you know, if you play those numbers in, you know, it's, you know, you've got two guys, two, you know, two trucks, four guys, you know, for, for a day for that zone, and then you do four zones. So you'd have to, you know, put those numbers together. And then you have your disposal costs, which, they, you know, they take it to global, and then you know, they, they, they dispose of their your recycled materials. But you do have your own recycled facility as well. So that's, that, they, that doesn't include those costs that come with that. So. So, so just for context on that point specifically, Adam did provide this earlier today. Uh, yeah. They calculated 3120 man hours for the year, 3120. What, what was that again? For recycling. Okay. For, for total for recycling effort, 3120 hours, 20 man hours for the year. For year. That, that is on a high end. I mean, it fluctuates. I did it on pretty much what the most would be. We can go above that. Sure. Thank you. I'm not saying that's cheaper or more expensive. Right. That's, that's okay. one of your decision items. Yeah. You definitely would have Data to look points. at that. You'd have to do much more of a deeper dive. You've got the maintenance of the vehicle, the cost of the vehicle, the amortization of the vehicle. I don't know how old your trucks are that you're using right now. Most uh, in the industry, we kind of stretched it in the industry to 10 years. And after 10 years, you you're fully depreciated. You have a truck of no value. I don't know how old your trucks are, but that would have an impact. And that, that's also a big capital cost. And just as a point of information right now, you're looking at a new uh, 30 yard. If you're using a rear load packer, I don't know what you're using, but uh, are you using a side loader? Or... Are you using a mason dump? Oh, well. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it's older than 10 years old, yeah. Huh? We're a small town. How old is it? Yeah, all right. Well, that... that... How old is the Mason Dump truck? Well, the one is... We have two old cabins. We also do the other one. So, we're on the right, So, the old ones, the old truck we have is three going to the bus. That's also, I mean, you can't overfill them. I mean, and again, you're doing the best you can. No, I'm not saying your program is good, bad, or otherwise. I would say to you, in a bid, just as a point of information, if you go to bid, you would prohibit the use of a dump truck in a bid under state regulation. I wouldn't allow a private vendor to do that right. uh, because of the, what it would do to the recyclables. If therefore you've converted to a Packer truck or any kind of other truck, just to give you context, you're looking at a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar capital investment for one okay. truck. Uh, it's it's none of this is cheap today, and everything is and and if you're even remotely considering improving it to that, you're looking at a two year window to get the truck if you want to customize. But that's that does for buying okay. our own truck, doing it ourselves. That's Doesn't matter if you're in private sector or public sector. The only people who can get trucks today, right now. In the private sector are the large companies and they only get chassis. Mm -hmm. They always have so many chassis in reserve. Waste manager probably has a hundred chassis somewhere that they can put a body on. But even that takes time. Any conversion. That's the other thing slowing down bidding. People can't get the trucks. 
they win the bid and they don't have any trucks left to do the service. They just can't, you can't just go onto a lot and get a customized vehicle. You can get trucks and it's a little faster than two years today, but you can't get a customized truck. If you're in private sector, you want that truck to be your truck. I don't know that this helps you at all, but it, it, it's the it's just some background on where we are in the bidding process. Uh, and I don't know if you have problems or anything here that, that you know has triggered this, or if it's just an, a general intellectual exercise in trying to look at the future, which is not a bad thing to do. So maybe a little bit of a combination of both. Um, you know, the the genesis of this conversation was just from folks in the community asking about. It. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, maybe Debbie, if you could, you might be actually a reasonable person to provide some insight into this. Do people call down to the garage and ask about this? Yes. So when a resident moves into town, they need to set up their water and sewer bill. So when they listen to the options, they call the road department. So they'll ask me how to do it. And they'll say, while I have you on the phone, what is the garbage collection and the recycling collection? So I welcome them to the town of Newton and tell them, unfortunately, we don't offer curbside collection that's on them to provide their own hauler. But lucky for them, we do provide curbside collection and then you know direct them to the website for the recycling. Oh. So they're never happy. Um, most people coming to town are coming from other locations that do have trash as part of their previous service. So, and, and you're obviously not going to have a specific figure on this, but it, is this like once a week, a couple times a month? It, it varies because we have an influx depending on the time of year. It seems like maybe like spring, you'll get the phone calls inquiring for. Residents can call and get an inquiry on what that resident are looking. The residents are looking to purchase water or sewer benefits. Mm -hmm. So they can get an approximate. So then they'll ask about like all different services. Then you have, you know, the people will move in in the summer. And then you have sometimes the people in the fall. So it, it varies on the time of year. Thank you. I would tell you that, you know, ironically, in one of the committees I'm working with where the number has gone up about 35 percent, how can we save money? You can go to subscription service. Mm -hmm. You'll save a lot of money as a town, but someone has to pay for it. That's the one element in garbage collection we have. No matter how you do it, someone's paying. And that's something for you to consider as well. It's, it's not an inexpensive service to set up, even on a big basis. A lot of data collection you would have to do. Uh, you know this probably better than anybody, depending on how long y'all have been in office or worked for this township. Uh, no matter what you decide to do, you are not going to make everybody happy. I don't think I have to tell you that. Um, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with the hallways. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And in communities where we have recommended saying you want to save money, you can go to bid. Uh, the number of people that came out to defend their hauler because the hauler might not be able to do the whole community is changes the dynamic that much further. This is a, oddly enough, a very emotional topic for people. You wouldn't think so, but it is quite emotional. People get very attached to their garbage and how it's picked up. And they will tend to like their hauler. I like my I hauler. I like my hauler. So he, <laughs> I have a very local man, who's, you know, he and his wife run the company and he's got one, two trucks, that's it. And he work, they work super hard. Mm -hmm. in, in your experience specifically within recycling yeah. um, in communities that have transitioned to municipal service via bid have you seen any gross change in recycling tonnage so you know we provide your in, in newton we provide mm -hmm. your zone once a month curbside collection if you were to transition that, or if you've seen in other municipalities a transition from a semi-monthly to a weekly or some other more frequent collection, have you seen gross change in recycling tonnage? Because we do get the tonnage grant based on recycling. I don't have your number exactly on the tonnage, but to, to put it, uh, the simplest way to put it is with recycling, the more convenient the recycling program, the more people will put recyclables out. The big question, of course, you have a well-trained recycling coordinator here. You have a situation where you're training the public and you have to teach them to put out the right things. 
the things that can be recycled, more frequent collection that is more convenient typically leads to higher numbers. What those numbers are will depend on what your baseline is. Again, I don't have your baseline, but you have two things that are, do help you with that. You do have your system in place for curbside and you do have a convenience center. And I would say the convenience centers are something I encourage all communities to have, whether they have once a month, twice a month collection, doesn't matter. Uh, I don't care if you have weekly collection. Where I live, we have bi-monthly collection. Uh, we also have dual stream, but it's a little different than your single stream program. And we also have a convenience center. Mm -hmm. The convenience center is useful, especially because that helps your tonnage go up more. That's my point. Because what that does is allows it allows people to bring materials that can't be put out at the curb, potentially, in a separate collection location. It allows them, if they miss the pickup, now you don't have to wait a whole other month in your case. I can go on whatever day that facility is open. They tend to be very popular convenience centers. And you probably know that. And when you're running, I'm sure you're there. Uh, I've often said towns should put up a hot dog truck and a breakfast cart and make some extra money because they're always crowded on a weekend. Okay. You listening? <laughs> brand new, yes, brand new tree we just planted for our Arbor Day. Uh, but they are popular. They tend to be in in every community. By the way, I don't care if it's urban, suburban, or rural. They tend to become a Saturday thing to do, huh? or you yeah. know, go to meet somebody, have a cup of coffee afterwards. They become a very much a social event. And that's, that's what makes it work, by the way. That helps the recycling work because there is a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas. People talk, oh, I didn't know I couldn't recycle that. Oh, we can bring that here. And that helps your program a great deal in any town. Yes, convenience equals more tonnage. Whether the cost benefit is sufficient to double the collection, not gonna double your collection cost, but it will certainly increase that cost. I can't tell you that off the top of my head. Have you ever seen cooperative contracts where multi, mul multiple municipalities enter into an agreement? Well, if you can get that done, <laughs> uh, I have been working with both private and public sector on this. I've met with the state of New Jersey on the state of New Jersey would love it. Mm. They would love to see that happen. Getting two communities, you just heard Sparta's very specific program for their bid. And getting a neighboring community to agree to that same contract, it's often a matter of two things, timing, the contracts don't line up at the right time. And it's my garbage is better than their garbage. <laughs> and, and we don't want to we don't want to mix our garbage with their garbage. And I know that sounds really silly, but that is the way communities tend to think. I've worked with a couple of communities. I have heard it, it recently that in Gloucester County, there are two municipalities that have started that discussion. I don't know where it is right now. Yeah. It would it would certainly be more cost effective statewide if communities could do that, especially smaller communities. But the problem is, again, getting elected officials from both communities to agree on everything. It's just not it's not a knock. It's just the nature of the way we run our communities. It's a good idea. That much I would tell you. If I could just say that, you know, the one I gave you, that that's only one of, you know, I, I spoke directly with Blue Diamond that has that contract. And they have seven other, I think seven other municipalities in Sussex County. And some of them are much smaller than that one, right. that one there, and much more rural. So the, there's a whole you know, different variety. I have not looked into their contracts, but there it's, it's you know, talk about Sparta, but, you know, they, they gave out towns like Hampton and Green and Franklin, you know, that's, number of the towns that do it. I'm sure they all have different kind of contracts. It also depends on who you do. I, I will, from a personal point of view, move from a town which had curbside pickup, part of the taxes, moved down to Bridgewater 35 years ago and could not for the life of me understand why I was paying for garbage sewer and water was all part of my taxes on but the other thing that makes life easier and i think you have the same issue and i think tom as well if the county does all the recycling dual stream all the recycling provided the cans the whole nine yards that it came out of county taxes so the only thing that we're paying for is the standard garbage collection 
I'm not aware that Sussex is running right out and doing county wide recycling. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> that's not, I, I can almost predict they that's not going to happen. No, I intend to agree. I'm just saying that's another way people are looked into cooperative services. But just like you heard the chief talk about cooperative services, um, auto body garbage is even more problematic because today is the day I would normally collect in Newton, but it's a holiday. <laughs> so the next available day is fill in the blanks day. They but you now I got to think of this stuff. I can't think of Newton stuff. And you see this with the private haulers as it is. The other part you also have to be aware of in my experience, but no, I'm not as knowledgeable on certain things as William is. I have 40 plus years of dealing with government. And the one thing I can tell you is you're missing something very important you won't miss if you go out for a municipal bid. The daily phone calls, wanting to know why the garbage is on the street, why they didn't come and pick up my stuff. Now you may be getting a handful of that now when you private, you will now get them all because you're the contractor. Uh -huh. You're the, whether it, you're picking it up yourselves or whether you go out for bid and get a haul. You will get the phone calls. They don't know how to call the hall. Just like they don't know how to call the board of ed of the county industry. They don't know how to call the hall. <laughs> so you will be having somebody spending good pieces of the day dealing with those issues that you are currently now not dealing with. Uh, the calls can be, I have currently, when the lieutenant I'm working with, 40 or 50 emails that because they're looking at contracting right now, uh, renewing a contract. And the number of complaints are very creative. And the photographs and the you know, one with a bear going through a bag in the suburban area, as you can imagine, that freaks everybody out. Whereas up here, it's like, okay, there's another bear in the neighborhood. Uh, in the other thing you'll get is, my neighbor did this. How come it's so dirty? And, and those calls do come in and they do basically have to have in one committee that we, I give them credit. They went to a card system and they reduced the capacity that every homeowner could have. They went from unlimited to 64 gallons. That's it. That's all you could put out for garbage. They had to put on two full-time staff just to handle it. And, and the calls are not, not always pleasant. And that that's true. I mean, you would have that in Bridgewater's like where I live mm -hmm. next door, next down over. Uh, we all have subscription service. It does work. I, I can't tell you one's better than the other. You know, it's it's really what your community wants. If it you know, the old adage, if it's if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it is, you should be and looking at this and asking the questions, that is your job. I get mm -hmm. that. And that doing the research is a good idea. But I'm not certain. I'm not certain where you want to go with this exactly. I'm still not certain. Other than you're, in, other than you're doing research, which I think is prudent. I, I give you that. But those calls will come in, and you will have to put a dedicated phone line in, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, Debbie will need mailocks. Per perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she already does. Um, <laughs> what, what, one of the other potential unknowns here, I think, the exact question you just asked. You know, what what does our community want? And you know, clearly the question is out there, but the question is how pervasive is the question, okay. and which then potentially leads to the next alternative. Well, not alternative, I think next strategy here. What is the time frame and cost on potentially adding it as a non-binding referendum question? We have a presidential election coming up. You're not going to get a better election to have people voice their voice their opinion. That's right, my baby. That, I said, that's Leaving aside the timing, mm -hmm. you have a clue the question you're going to ask because unless you're going to fill in the blanks that Wayne has just and Corey have just discussed the generic question of do you want municipal right. garbage pickup, yes or no, I can guarantee right. you the answer. Yeah. It's going to be yes. overwhelmingly yes. Then when you fill in, two parts will happen. First of all, when it passes 80-20, and you can't make it happen. The AD ain't happy because you asked, you left us with the belief because non-binding referendums, you understand, the public doesn't. Mm -hmm. The public does not grasp non-binding. They think they voted for something. They expect you to carry it out. 
assuming that even there is a desire to carry it out, you ask that generic question under 1937, then you got to fill in all the blanks. And when you start filling in all the blanks, the answer is, well, how come you didn't ask us that? And how come you didn't tell us it was going to be $35 a week for maybe et cetera, et cetera. So before you think long and hard and the time frame, I believe is August, if my recollection is correct. It's I'm not positive because I think it, I thought it changed with the last year and they changed some of the dates on things. It's. That's what you're saying. Like, what, what's, figure, what's the figure feasibility? The is it even this, feasible? Figure for the sake of this yeah. discussion, it's Labor Day. Okay. Because that's about the time that you start talking about playing with the ballots and questions. Think long and hard about the kind of question because you're not going to get a long. Will you vote for it? Long right. This is not right, right, some. Right. This is not some question that you see in November that people look at and, and go into the voting booth and their eyes glaze over. <laughs> because that's not what non they're non binding. I'm not sure. I mean, I have to have the ballot names for printing to the county before September 2nd. That's when that goes well, to the printer. The, the, the so if we even introduce a because we have to do it by ordinance, right? Yeah. And do it by resolution. The point is if the council wants a quick and dirty, we'll give you the update on the non-binding. I'm just pointing out that doing it right. comes with its own major pitfalls because it's always easy to vote yes on something, especially if it's going to be something I want without knowing what else comes with it. And then you're going to get the question, well, how do I know? I mean, if how you do I know do how the... about, you know, how do I know what I'm voting for? And you're all going to have to put an instructive interpretive statement that goes right. along with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, or, or just a, it, is it, is it even possible before we even enter? The answer it? is it's all, it's pop. I also have to look to see whether or not it's something you can actually put on the ballot. Right. Because not everything is allowed to be placed on a non-binding referendum. Mayor, if I could jump in. Please. So the staff recommendation is status quo. I don't, I don't think I've, you know, hidden that from anyone that we think the private subscriber model is working and the municipal recycling. So really what I'm looking for tonight, if the council is willing to straw poll it, is if the council, the majority wants status quo. Does the council want us? And, you know, I'm not saying referendum or not. That's up for all of you. But from my perspective as the manager who's been tasked with this, does the council want us to go in-house? Do you want us to hire new staff tr trucks, insurance costs, and go that model? It, I'm not saying good or bad. That it's, a, it's a policy decision. But obviously, that's a lot of money that's unbudgeted and will trigger tax increases of substantial nature does the council want to look at a town-wide contract which is you know wayne's expertise for sure he's written bids and you know Corey has too but m my sense is with the number of households that's probably a million dollar contract and unless monica tells me otherwise that's probably 15 tax points so i'm not quite sure where we get a million dollars in a municipal budget to provide this service that seems to be working with the private sector. But as I always say, I serve at the pleasure of, and if you guys want to go down the route of in-house or town-wide contract, I'm looking for direction tonight so that I can either put this to bed with status quo or go in one of the other two directions, which most likely I would look to hire Wayne's firm probably to do the deep dive analysis to whatever cost that would be. And then, you know, really start pre preparing either for an in-house model, which obviously I had in Parsippany and that worked very well, although that was 52,000 people and the townwide contract model Randolph. I've seen that with success too. So as Wayne said, there's no one size fits all, but I, I do struggle, especially after Sandy had concerns with, Ordinance 2024-20, and we have concerns about 51000 for an auto shop that now we're considering a million dollars in re uh, garbage collection costs that I, I don't know where to find those kinds of dollars. So respectfully looking for a straw poll or some direction from, from the body this evening so I can determine if additional staff and engineering and possibly consultant time should be put towards this or if we're just going to stick with the status quo. 
There you go. Thoughts? So for me personally, right off the top, like I want to do more homework. Like you guys were saying, you gave some good numbers, but you know, to be able to give, you know, Tom direction tonight, what I think we should go, you're going to have to give me a couple hours to get an Excel spreadsheet together and start plugging in some numbers. I can't make that. I can't provide direction tonight. Thanks. Okay. I personally am in favor of staying the same because as a senior citizen, I personally maybe spend $5 a month to take my garbage up to SUMA. And that's about all I spend a month. If I'm lucky, maybe less. And so I would rather just stay the same as a senior citizen. Matt, yeah. Um, uh, right, right now, just kind of looking at it, I, I'm, I'm thinking that it might just make sense. Um, I mean, it's, it's only every so often you get somebody that that's new that comes in. I, I don't know how much of a ground swell there actually is um, to, to change it. So I, I'm comfortable with just keeping it how it is right now at the subscription model. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think we have a very balanced approach by having the social recycling center and the services that are provided. And I know that um, we have a lot of people that appreciate that pickup. And I think that, um, you know, the market prevails when you have a subscription type of service. As a consumer, I can shop the couple of providers and choose the company that I, that's going to provide the best service. I happen to like my hauler um, for, for various reasons. Um, and I think that for our size municipality, you know, the phone calls that might be coming in, it sounds like based on the data that you presented are probably people that are moving from urban areas out to the country um, for, you know, a better cost of living perhaps, or whatever, to be a little more um, less, urban, moving from urban out to rural, I think is what I was trying to say. Um, so I agree. I think uh, based on the presentation tonight and Mr. Japail, thank you very, very much. I, I learned um, a lot about municipal land uh, or municipal garbage collection. I mean, just even Corey, looking at the Sparta numbers at 425 a year, $35 a month, they have three times the number of you know um, households that we have, so I would think that the price would even be higher. Um, it could be, but they get twice, twice a week pickup, garbage pickup. Right. They get recyclers, you know, single stream, you know, once a week, and they get some bulk pickup as well. So they have a number of items that are on top of that. The numbers I get that I've received would range from twenty five dollars a, a, a month for just garbage pickup to forty five dollars a, a month if you have the recycle. So it's some So you, you take the average of thirty five times our twenty five municipalities that puts us at little over a million, which is sixteen and a third tax points. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we had feedback from the public tonight about half a tax point, um, you know, increase. So I am in favor of leaving a status quo as well. So my thoughts were much more so in line with Michelle's, um, but uh, you know we have a three to two split here, so <laughs> Strop will complete it. Yeah, and I I should say like that I think the subscription service probably would win in the end, but you know to you know fairness, you know because that question does come up a lot, you know, and so if we had the actual you know statistics behind it, and I know that you know Helen and Sandy, I think years ago you guys looked into this and the price was extremely high. So, you know, even if we have that data, Tom, if you can, you know, pull from that and just say, you know, a couple of years ago, it would have been $50 a month compared to what Sandy and I, and, and maybe even JP know, and Matt know what we're paying each month. Right. It gives us just a better idea. And then do we also have to exclude all of the, um, it's the word of commercial. commercial? Yeah, commercial, like commercial and, and other well, we get to that, Yeah. yeah. Uh, we didn't even get to that. And that's a big fight in communities as well. You do, By the way, you do not have to provide that service to commercial, unlike okay. apartments. Uh, that is a little different. How about uh, uh, non-rateable 
properties, which are a third Houses of ours. Houses of worship and not for profits, you don't have to provide service to them. Now, this is this In is fact, that's a dangerous road to go down because yeah. of a number of reasons. Right. Yeah, but we we estimated on the residential it was a million dollars a year. And like I said, I can't, you know, we struggle to go from 64 to 36. How do I justify 15 tax point increase annually? To, you know, it may be in a different circumstance in a different financial picture, maybe a bigger town. Like I said, I've seen every model work. And I just think you're, you're all blessed that, you know, the model that Newton has had for all these years I mean, Sandy, to Sandy's point, you you have options other people don't have. The fact that you can bring refuse to a facility and pay five dollars to, you know, find that anywhere else. It, it's few and far between. And in-house, you know, imagine the staffing cost and the trucks and the insurance costs to build that kind of an empire as much as Kenny and Adam would be thrilled with it. Um uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and, 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 you know. I don't, and I don't think in any of our precursory conversations that, you know, that was really on the table it was more looking to outsource it. Um, I, and I will tell you, I've done studies for many communities on in-house versus outsourcing. And there really is no, I can't come up with a good number most of the time. Once I apply full price. cost accounting principles, it, it doesn't really work. For what it's worth, uh, this advice I would give you is, uh, you you have an in-house system for recycling collection, which is obviously working. If I was going to look at anything and have my staff look at anything, it would be to get your a proper recycling collection vehicle with automated or semi-automated capabilities and convert your recycling to a card system to prevent your workers from having to lift the recycling. Uh, that if, if you were going to look at spending money, don't spend it on me doing consulting. That you can do in-house. And that would be a better expenditure. I pers my personal and professional recommendation to save your laborers and to be more efficient. That's a whole other conversation. That We're is a whole to other conversation. Just mechanic services. <laughs> Correct. I know. I understand what the discussion has been, uh, and I know that's not something that's easy. But it is something. If you were going to spend the kind of money that we're talking about, and it wouldn't be that much because you wouldn't need as much, but it it would be. A more effective use of your funds. Well, thank you for your yes. Thank you very <laughs> much. Bono time tonight. <laughs> thank you. It's my pleasure yes. to be here. I always like coming back up here. I always consider it a home like to me. Corey, Wayne, Debbie, Adam, Kenny, all your work. Thank you very much. Yeah. All the topics. We're running into the latest council meeting of the years. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, wear lots of my hats claim today. to fame. <laughs> all right. Nice um, so on that note, uh, unless there are any final. Uh, yeah, discussion mayor i need a two-minute adjournment so that you and eric could give me a call please okay very good uh, are there any other comments generally council manager comments about the night the evening anything at all i'll just reiterate your comments to the staff i you know you we put you guys under a lot of pressure today with a lot of questions you know and you guys you know got us a lot of answers in a short time so apologize that it was later than we probably should have, but appreciate all everyone's effort as always. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I will uh, move uh, to take you... a recess, please. Yes, please. I, we have to do other things. Please. Please. Here, recess at 920. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. What's the bathroom code? What's the bathroom code? It's unlocked. Oh, it's 3521. It's the phone. Oh, got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Do you want to say it's there? Nice and clean. I'm going to sleep. I'm not going to meet him. 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 We never have meetings. Especially about who? Where'd you get them from? Um, The place, uh, the, the new wildfire, wildfire, just as a scammy. Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 spring street, the old wildflowers by Tan. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just know. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay. Back in session. Hold on, I gotta unmute and start video. He said this could happen. No, I just have to keep hitting it. Ah, here we go. All right, get rid of my little. All right. Recording. Yep, we are recording. Mary, a motion to come out of recess. Uh, a motion to come out of recess at 9.32 p.m. Second. All in favor? All in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 After conversations with the manager and the mayor, folks, I'm asking and we're suggesting a motion to adjourn. Uh, the advice of council, uh, a motion to adjourn at 9.32 p.m. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I opposed because we had a request. What was the... Having a request, there's no provisions in the on the agenda for an executive session and making a request is not necessarily within the purview of an individual member from the public employee or not to ask for an executive session. You can't. So it's a three to one vote to adjourn. We are adjourned. 933. Oh, what is my phone? Matt's not on the meeting. I'm here. Oh, I thought. Oh, sorry, Matt. The motion to adjourn, man. Motion to adjourn, yay or nay? Yay. All right, four to one. We're adjourned. Okay.